This is WBCQ, bringing world's last chance radio to you from Monticello, Maine, USA. Violent crime, political unrest, financial instability. Everything points to an impending crisis, a crisis like no other. Tune in to World's Last Chance Radio to learn how you can spiritually prepare for what lies ahead. WLC Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's imminent return. Hello. I want to give you a very warm welcome to all our listeners here. I'm your host, Miles Roby. And I'm Dave Wright. We're really glad that you could join us. Now, if this is your first time tuning in, you'll notice quite quickly that we rarely use titles to refer to the Creator. We prefer to use the Father's personal name, Yahweh or Yah, as well as the personal name of the Son, Yahushua. Today, we're going to be talking about faith healing and what it is popularly referred to as being slain in the spirit. Now, it's it's a tricky area to touch on because I do believe there are sincere Christians whose faith have been rewarded and whom Yah has blessed with healing through some of these faith healers. However, the spirits manifested by faith healers and those who claim to be slain in the spirit is not that of the Holy Spirit of Yah. And I think as we get into that, it'll become a lot more clearer. And that is a movement that is not from Yah. Before we go any further, let's start by defining some terms. The phrase slain in the spirit is sometimes referred to as falling in the spirit or resting in the spirit. It happens most commonly when a minister or faith healer lays hands on someone and he or she falls to the floor. I think that's been called the touch of power, isn't it? Yes, right. Now, the assumption is that the minister or faith healer is so filled with the power of the Holy Spirit that when he touches someone else, that person is in turn overwhelmed by the presence of the Spirit of Yah, and that's why he or she collapses. That's what being slain means. The person doesn't die just collapses because he or she is completely overwhelmed by the divine presence transferred through the minister or faith healer. I've actually watched some video footage of this phenomenon and to be honest it's kind of gave me the creeps Uh, but but then again I, I do believe that there are many sincere people caught up in this but they're not going to participate in something they believe is wrong. Now, what do they base this practice on? Do you know, Dave? There are a few verses in the Bible that talk about Yah giving someone a vision and then he becomes as dead. You've got uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 17, where when John saw the glorified Christ, he says, I've got it here, um, he fell at his feet as dead. Then you've got Ezekiel's experience, where in chapter 1, he says that when he saw the glory of Yahweh, he fell on his face. Daniel also. In Daniel 8, he says that he was frightened and fell on his face. His reaction to the vision in Daniel 10 was that no strength was left in him. So those are the passages on which they base this practice, because clearly if John, Ezekiel and Daniel as righteous men and prophets could be overcome with divine glory, we would be too. Mm, I know I would be. As well. well, yes, and the problem is, when you carefully compare Scripture with Scripture, you realise that the modern practice of being slain in the Spirit is actually quite different from what occurs in Bible times. Furthermore, the lives of the various faith healers strongly suggest that the Spirit that animates them is not actually from heaven, but from an entirely different source. In his first letter to Timothy, Paul warns about seducing spirits. So would you read it for us, please, Miles? It's found in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. 
When you carefully consider all the evidence, the charismatic teaching of being slain in the spirit is one such doctrine of devils. Now, of course, with Yah, as we know, all things are possible. Yeah, absolutely. I want to be careful here that we don't go so far as to say that no person has ever been healed by going to a faith healer for help or that no person has ever been overcome by the divine presence to the point of collapsing. The Creator is all-powerful. It's perfectly possible he could indeed come upon a person with such force he or she would be overcome. The problem is not whether or not Yahweh can do this, but whether such a belief is biblical because our beliefs influence our practices. And this practice of going to some apparently powerful faith healer and being slain in the spirit has exploded in charismatic circles. And we have to ask ourselves, is that biblical? Mm. Well, now a moment ago, you said that when you carefully compare scripture with scripture, you find that this is not of Yah. Could you give us an example of that? Well, let's use an example that charismatic Christians use to defend their practice. It's found in Second Chronicles, and it describes a dedication in Solomon's temple. Now, maybe you could read it for us. It's Second Chronicles chapter 5, and it's verses 13 to 14. It came even to pass, as the trumpeters and singers were as one, to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking Yahweh, and when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music, and praised Yahweh, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth for ever, that then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of Yah. So that the priests could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of Yahweh had filled the house of Yah. Notice there is not a single instance in what you just read that describes someone collapsing under the power of Yah or mm. even any healing taking place. No, just the opposite. Well, really. yes, and, and you'd think that if ever there was a time for the power of Yah to be demonstrated in healing his faithful followers, it would be at such a time, right? Mm, right, yeah. Well, in fact, it's just the opposite. Looking a few verses earlier, just, just there a few moments ago, at verse 11, it says, all the priests that were present were sanctified. Now, that's significant because it was against the Levitical code for any man not in perfect health to serve before Yahweh. So, of course, none of the priests present would have been seeking healing. Or they would not have been there. Yeah, good point. Another example from Scripture that Charismatics point to in defence of their belief is the story of Yahushua's arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane. Ah, uh, yeah, that's right. Just just give me a second to look that up here, because um, it's in John 17, I think. It's, no, 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 one second. No, it's John, John 18. Yeah. John 18, uh, verses 5 to 6. Uh, Yahushua had just asked, who are you looking for? They answered him, Yahushua of Nazareth. Yahushua saith unto them, I am he, and Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Now another passage is the story of the conversion of Saul of Tarsus recorded in Acts 9. Okay. So why don't you read that one for us next, yep. please? Sure. Okay, that's verses 3 to 4, and it says... And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Yeah, and, and I can see why they quote these verses. Sure, but... Neither the wicked collapsing at Yahushua's arrest nor the collapse of Saul can be used to support the modern belief of falling in the spirit because, as you pointed out earlier, those who approach the various faith healers are typically very sincere-hearted believers whose hearts, to the best of their knowledge, are right with Yah. Mm, and that's true. And, of course, they would have done some heart-searching before even going up to the healer because, obviously, they seek 
Yah's blessing. Now, as mentioned earlier, there are a few instances in Scripture where a man of Yah was overcome by heavenly grandeur, glory, divine power. Mm. There is a notable difference between these descriptions and what happens when a person is slain in the spirit today. And what's that? Well, You've seen the video footage of such occasions, you said. Mm, right, and there's quite a few on YouTube that you can watch as well. Well, I'm going to read a couple of verses, and you tell me if you can see the difference. OK, right, this should be interesting. Daniel chapter 10, verses 9 to 10, states, quote, Yet heard I the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground. And behold, an hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. Mm. And the next? Revelation chapter 1, verse 17. We mentioned it earlier. It says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Uh. I can spot the difference. I'm, I'm not really sure what we're looking for, but, but one difference I can tell right off is that in modern times, people go straight over backwards. In fact, they usually have a couple of big, burly guys back there to catch <laughs> the person going over backwards. Exactly right. In Scripture, when a person was overcome by the power and the sheer glory of the divine presence, the direction in which they fell was always forward onto their faces in an act of worship. They never collapsed at anything but the divine presence. Not the divine presence in another human being, but the actual presence of the Father or the Son. That's all. Right. And we're never supposed to collapse in worship at the foot of even the holiest of created beings. See, I remember a couple of times in Revelation, uh, John did that. And in Revelation 19, verse 10, as well as chapter 22, verse 9, and each time... The angel immediately corrected him and told him to stop. See, thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of the book, worship Yah. Right, yeah, yeah, that's, that's the one. You, you see, the angel immediately deflected all obeisance to Yahweh. You certainly don't see any of these faith healers telling people to just, you know, snap out of it. And it's completely different today. When Daniel collapsed, the angel immediately reached out to strengthen him. John, too, was immediately strengthened when he was overcome by the power of Yah. See, I've never once seen a charismatic evangelist or faith healer reach out to strengthen those supposedly overcome by the power of Yah. Instead, it looks like they, well, they revel in it. You know, they view it as a demonstration of their power, you know, an affirmation that they are the spokesman for Yahweh. It's almost like a... I suppose pride thing for them, Dave. You mentioned how they'll have men up there to catch those who are slain, and sometimes mm. those men themselves will collapse and flop about. It's all a grand display. Yeah. But even with the precaution of having catchers, people have been hurt before by these melodramatic so-called healings. Benny Hinn is an Israeli televangelist who is very famous worldwide for his miracle crusades. Oh, yeah. Now, we're, we're talking about how they revel in displays of what they see as their power. Yeah, well, Hinn doesn't even touch them. He almost makes a joke of it as well. He'll strip off his suit jacket and wave it at them and they'll all fall down and they'll even blow at them. And it's, it's, it's so... Undignified, it really is, and not, not all that in keeping with the meek and lowly one that is Scripture's description of Yahushua. Well, on September the 23rd, 1986, a woman by the name of Ella Peppard died after receiving injuries at one of his revivals. No, seriously? What happened? Well, 15 days before her death, there was a revival that she attended. Now, Miss Peppard was an elderly woman, 85 years old, she was waiting in line to be blessed by Hin when he struck the man standing in front of her so hard that the man lost his balance. He flew backwards, knocking Miss Peppard down, causing her to break her hip. Oh, how awful. That's terrible. Well, it gets worse. According to NewsOK.com, who reported it, instead of offering her medical assistance, Hin ordered Peppard removed from the stage and placed in a seat near the front of the church. When one usher offered to seek medical aid for Peppard, witnesses said Hin stopped the usher and said, Leave her alone. God will heal her. That's terrible. That really is horrible. 
It's so inconsistent with the way Yahuwah operates. Listen, we're just going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. When Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins wrote the book Left Behind, they probably had no idea that their book would grow into a 12-volume New York Times best-selling series, but it did. That's how fascinated people are with the coming of Yahushua. The problem is, the Left Behind series suggests a fictionalized end-time scenario where believers are taken to heaven in a secret rapture. To learn why the doctrine of a secret rapture is unbiblical, visit our website at worldslastchance.com. Look for the video, The Secret Rapture, Satan's Secret Weapon. You can also watch it on YouTube. Learn the truth about the time of the end. Watch The Secret Rapture, Satan's Secret Weapon on worldslastchance.com. I was just thinking about the melodrama that accompanies all of these faith healing services, and yet this sort of thing has been around for a long time. In, in 1851, Charles Hodges writes, quote, There is nothing in the Bible to lead us to regard these bodily affections as the legitimate effects of religious feelings. No such results followed the preaching of Christ or his apostles. We hear of no general outcries, faintings, convulsions or ravings in the assemblies which they addressed. It is evident that loud outcries and convulsions are inconsistent with these things and therefore ought to be discouraged. They cannot be from Yah, for he is not the author of confusion. That's an excellent point there. Very. Robert Leachow was once himself involved in this movement. Now, though, he warns people against it. He asks a really good question. He says, quote, If God is knocking people down, why do we need to catch them? Oh, that's a very good point. <laughs> Leachow goes on to say, They explain this manifestation as being directly caused by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. If this is so... Is he not mighty enough to see to it that those he sovereignly knocks down are unhurt by his blessing? These churches employ catches because, one, they know people fake falling many times. It is a programmed response. Two, they lack faith in their own stated beliefs. Obviously, God is not big enough to safeguard his people. And they are most excellent points. Well done. And there's more. And he says, oh. quote, Also, along with the catchers, we had sisters who came along beside or behind the catchers with large sheets of material. Their ministry was to place these sheets over the women's legs and bodies. Why? Because many times when women would be slain in the spirit, they would fall in very immodest positions. Hmm. We had events where, when some unfortunate woman fell, their dresses would be hiked up their bodies quite a bit and their legs would be splayed out at inappropriate angles. When the Lord chose to embarrass his daughters in this manner, we had to be there quickly to cover up their shame. Does this really sound like something Yahuwah Elohim would do to his daughters? No, no, it really doesn't. In John chapter 8, Yahushua promised, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. More and more people who were once actively involved in this movement have broken free of the deception and come out against it. They're now warning others to beware. Mark Havill is one such person. When asked what got him out of it, Havill replied that he simply read the scriptures. Yeah, and, and the word of Yah is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path if we'll just pay attention to what it says. And Mike Wright is someone else who no longer believes the Bible supports this practice. He points to another problem with this belief, and that is peer pressure. He tells the story of being at a prayer breakfast at which Benny Hinn spoke. And Mike was with his mother, and at some point Hinn prayed for Mike's mum. In describing the uncomfortable experience later, he said, quote, Mum was not slain in the spirit, but she told me that if Benny had tarried longer with his hand pushing her forehead back, she probably would have been. This was her somewhat embarrassed response to the fact that she hadn't been faithful enough or yielded enough or righteous enough 
to have been blessed with this supposedly wonderful act of the Holy Spirit. And then he adds, quote, This was my first-hand view of the guilt implicitly and often explicitly placed on the seeker recipient. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Pressure is put on the person seeking a blessing or healing to demonstrate a physical response to the power of the Spirit. If they don't have one, it is assumed by both those watching and the individual that the fault lies with the person for lacking sufficient faith. And it's peer pressure brought to bear in the spiritual realm. And Wright concluded his observations by saying this, quote, I could relay over 30 years' worth of stories to you. And the conclusion of them all is that we have unknowingly participated in a farce, deceived by people who knew better or who should have known better. Having studied Yah's word on the matter exhaustively now, we clearly denounce the teaching of slain in the spirit. Nowhere is the practice found in the Bible, and only on the enemies of Yah did an overwhelming force come to cause them to fall backwards. In every other case that is specified, men who came into the presence of Yahweh fell willingly forwards on their face in humble worship, or they died. Very starkly stated, but very true. And he's right. He is. And remember, such experiences occur in front of crowds of people during evangelistic crusades or whatever. Some mm. are even televised. This really increases the pressure brought to bear to demonstrate that your heart is right with Yahweh. And of course, the way this is demonstrated is by falling down. Down, yeah, absolutely. But, but as we said all along, a lot of sincere people get swept up in this. So how does this work really? Mark Havel, the man mentioned earlier, who studied his way to truth just by reading the Bible. Yeah, yeah, I remember, yeah. Well, he was asked in an interview just how it all works. And he listed five points that make such faith healings possible. Number one, he said, is that people are suggestible. When a person is in a suggestible state of mind or altered state of consciousness, they're more likely to be influenced by the speaker as well as the reactions of those around them. That's true. You can really see that in some of the YouTube videos that we've been searching through and some of those uh, faith healing crusades. And that's not all. According to Havil, program leaders deliberately select music that corresponds with a person's heart rate. The beat in most praise and worship music aligns really well with the cardiovascular system. So unbeknownst to them, it gets them almost into a... A trance state, would you say? Well, if not that, at least it makes them more susceptible to being influenced. As mm. Havil points out, entertainers understand the power of a group dynamic. And don't kid yourself, these televangelists are entertainers in a very real sense. Oh, they really are. And this is why comedians and rock stars have opening acts to warm up the crowd. Group dynamics also work in favour of faith healers when the expectation of the thousands of people watching is that you will fall when touched on the forehead. What's going to happen? Most people are going to fall. Absolutely. And having bright lights and television cameras right in your face doesn't help matters either. No. And then, of course, there's always neuro-linguistic programming, NLP, and Ericksonian hypnosis. Repetitive speech patterns and even certain tones of voice can help induce impressionable mindsets. Some pastors who studied NLP even boast of their ability to hypnotise their audience. So it's hypnosis that makes people think they're healed, is it right? Well, that definitely plays a part of it. And for a period of time, their pain may very well appear to be gone. But follow-up studies have revealed that the vast majority of those who at first thought they were healed were in fact not. Charles mm. S. Price held a revival in British Columbia, Canada, in which 350 people believed themselves healed. Six months later, a follow-up study revealed some very disturbing results. Of the 350 people who had believed themselves healed, 301 were still sick, 39 had actually died, and five had gone insane. Only five claimed to be still healed. And, of course, those who are still sick now felt an added burden of guilt, I suppose, for not having enough faith to maintain their healed state. Most likely they did. It's very sad. And the loving father is in none of this. Read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 14 to 15, and let's see what is really going on here. 
and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. This is exactly what is happening in this Pentecostal movement. Altered states of consciousness, spiritual trances, hypnosis, etc. Mm. But instead of using heathen trappings, they use Christian terminology. They pray to Yahushua. They call for revival and tell believers to have faith. That's how these Christian gurus clothe occult practices in robes of light. But mm. it's not from above. It's from the devil, and it's deceiving very sincere people. Mm, so is so. What we've what we've done is establish that it's not scriptural. That we know that for a start. But where did it come from, Dave? Well, faith healing and other overt displays attributed to Holy Ghost power have been around for a long time. The modern practice, though, received a large revival at the Toronto Airport Church in Toronto, Canada, in 1994. Paul Goldie was one of the founders of this movement. At first, he honestly thought it was of Yah. However, after seeing some people howl like dogs or act in animalistic ways while supposedly under the power of the Holy Spirit, he began to question the source. Well, yeah, such undignified displays make a mockery of sacred worship. What did he say? Well, in an interview, he warned, quote, Today I would say that this movement is something a lot darker. Today I believe that spirit is a false spirit, a counterfeit spirit, and not the Holy Spirit of Scripture. I would say that this was never a true, genuine manifestation of the Holy Spirit, because the fruit of that church is rotten. The Holy Spirit, by his very name, is holy. He will not encourage people to do anything unholy. People are made in the image of Yah. Why would Yahweh debase humanity by making them get on like animals? If there is anything that is manifested in these meetings contrary to the Holy Scripture, then it is not of Yahweh because Yah does not change. Do not embrace this. Do not think that this is a light thing. This is not of Yah. It is a scheme of the devil, and it will bring utter destruction to the men and the women and the children who embrace it. Wow, that's really something. Coming from one of those who were part of the original movement. So I find it encouraging, though, because uh, clearly anyone who truly desires truth is not going to be left deceived, and, and Yah simply won't allow it. Oh, that's right. We can trust Yahuwah to reveal the truth if we are willing to be convinced, if we are willing to take the time to study the evidence and not just automatically reject everything that contradicts our closely guarded beliefs. Mm. And following truth, no matter what the cost, often means giving up cherished assumptions when the Holy Spirit reveals that we've been wrong. But if, if we make that surrender, Yah will lead us into the truth just as he promised. If you have gotten involved with such irrational, emotional displays, please don't take our word for it that this is unbiblical. Read scripture for yourself. You know, prove all things by the word of Yah. Lay aside that which does not agree with his word and cling to that which is good. Yahuwah will always satisfy the soul hunger of anyone longing to be close to him. Matthew 5 verse 6 says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now that's a promise. Claim it, because the Father stands back of every promise he has ever made, and he will always keep his word. You are listening to World's Last Chance Radio on WBCQ at 93.30 kilohertz on the 31 meter band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. In recent years, a surprising teaching has been spreading throughout Christianity. Many sincere believers have begun to question whether the Apostle Paul was a true follower of Yahushua or an apostate. If Paul were an apostate, the ramifications of this are huge. Christian theology is based largely upon the writings of Paul. For a careful analysis of whether Paul was or was not an apostate, look for Paul 
false prophet, or true apostle on our website at worldslesschance.com. That's Paul, false prophet or true apostle on worldslesschance.com. Time to dive into our daily mailbag where we answer questions from listeners just like you. Right. You've got a full bag today, I can see. Quite a lot seems to have come in. What have you got for us today, Miles? Let's see. Uh, we have, uh, I hope I'm saying this right, Mutinta Shandala in Lusaka, Zambia. And Mutinta writes, We praise Yahuwah, our Father, and Yahushua, his Son, for the good work that you are doing. I am part of a small group that meets in homes every Sabbath day. A beloved sister of our group has been facing much resistance from her family over accepting the Sabbath. They ask her, why is the Sabbath hardly mentioned in the New Testament, while the other commandments are? We would be most grateful if you could help us know the best way to answer this question. It's a very good question, Dave. Absolutely. Thank you, Matinda, for writing to us. Please assure this sister that we have added her and her situation to our prayer list. As to why the other commandments are mentioned so much more than the Sabbath commandment, that's actually not true. The Sabbath is mentioned in the Gospels even more frequently than in the books of Moses. The thing you have to understand, though, is that it is mentioned in the context of the times. Context? What would you mean? The fourth commandment isn't quoted word for word in the Gospels, but Sabbath observance was a given. Nobody was questioning the validity of the Sabbath among first-century Jews or even among the early believers. They all worshipped on Sabbath, as demonstrated by the references in Acts to believers going to the synagogue on Sabbaths. There wasn't any need to repeat the command to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, since everybody already was. Instead, the issue at stake was always how the Sabbath should be kept. That is what all the discussions on the Sabbath focus on. Again, they were already keeping the Sabbath. Otherwise, they would not have cared so much about the particulars of keeping it properly. Yeah, I never thought of that before. But but can, can you just give us a couple of examples there? Well, certainly. Take the Gospel of Luke. Every time Yahushua heals someone on his own initiative, it was on the Sabbath. Mm. He was taking the opportunity to demonstrate proper Sabbath observance that it is always appropriate to help those in need. Take a look at Matthew chapter 12. Uh, would you start reading for us from there in verse 10, Miles? Okay. Behold, there was a man which had his hand withered, and they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days that they might accuse him? That was the whole point. They were trying to accuse the Lord of the Sabbath of breaking the Sabbath. That's quite ironic, though, isn't it? <laughs> okay, um... And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep, and if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. The thing we have to understand is that Yahushua was faced with a different concept of the Sabbath during his life on earth. I'm not sure I follow, Dave. Well, the rabbinical observance of the Sabbath was a religious change that accommodated the Roman Empire. Remember, amongst the hot-tempered Israelites, the Romans were constantly dealing with rebellions and insurgencies. They feared any Israelite claim to political power that would stir up the already rebellion-prone Israelites. So, the Jews focused on the letter of the law and set aside the Son of Man, Yahushua, who was also Lord of the Sabbath. The Pharisees used rabbinical methods to apply the law to all aspects of life, again focusing on the letter of the law as seen in the outward life while rejecting its influence on the heart. The Sadducees, a class from which the high priest was always selected, had their own method of doing away with the divine law. They limited the law to what it specifically states, denying the spiritual nature of the divine law. So what you're saying is both groups appeased the Romans and supported the status quo of the Roman rule. They just used different methods. Yeah, exactly right. Yahushua right. opposed both schools of thought, not only in regard to the Sabbath, but in the way they corrupted the divine law as well. He presented himself as the Messiah and refused to accommodate Rome. The Israelite leaders wanted to maintain their positions of influence. It was fear that led the leaders to reject him. 
It was in addressing their mistaken interpretations of the law and teaching true Sabbath observance that the Saviour repeatedly corrected the Jewish idea of Sabbath-keeping, and in doing so, the Sabbath is referred to more times in the Gospels than any of the other commandments. That makes sense. It really does. All right. Um, our next question is from Elizabeth Jokela from Lati in Finland. And she says, Dear WLC, I'm part of a ladies' Bible study group. We've been going through Revelation. We've really enjoyed your articles on prophecy. However... Could you please tell us why WLC teaches that the sounding of the seven trumpets of Revelation 8 and 9 has not yet happened? Also, why do you interpret the numbers given in relation to the trumpets literally? I always enjoy getting questions on prophecy. It's a favourite area of mine to study and has been for a long time. As to why WLC says the trumpets haven't happened yet, well, the short answer is because they haven't. Yeah. And the the long answer is? (laughs) okay. the traditional interpretation of the seven trumpets puts them back in history. The thing we have to remember is that the book of Revelation was given specifically for Yahweh's people living in the time of the end. A correct interpretation of Daniel 11 reveals that this time of the end time period began in 1798. The fact that the book of Revelation is focused primarily on end time events demonstrates that the traditional historic interpretation of the seven trumpets is incorrect. Think about the purpose of a trumpet in Bible times. When was it used? Uh, Well, to make an announcement, one would think, or to sound an alarm or perhaps a warning or to uh, to announce the arrival of a king. Yes, exactly. And the trumpets of Revelation, they do all that. They announce the end of the world is near and they declare the coming of the king of peace. So the whole purpose of the trumpets could not be truly fulfilled by the traditional historic interpretation. Furthermore, historical interpretations generally point to events that do not completely fit the details of each trumpet. Mm, That's a very good point. And that alone would let you know that you've got to look for a a more complete fulfilment. Yes, quite. There's nothing wrong with looking at historical applications of prophecy. A lot can be learnt from these partial applications. But it's important to remember that if a particular interpretation does not fulfil every single point of the prophecy, it can at best be considered only a partial application and we have to look for an additional complete application of the prophecy. Like John was told in Revelation 10, thou must prophesy again. Yeah, partial applications of prophecy aren't necessarily wrong or bad. Throughout the last 2,000 years, they've provided a lot of encouragement and strength to Yah's people through the ages. But we can't just stop and decide we know it all. Mm. Yeah, the sin of the Laodiceans being increased with goods and in need of nothing. While in reality, needing everything. So again, looking at the historical applications, you can learn things from partial fulfilments. But know that until every single detail of a prophecy has been fulfilled, there is yet a future complete application of the prophecy. Mm. The trumpets are an important part of Revelation, and if I recall correctly, they cover the greatest number of chapters in the book of Revelation. And it's not just chapters 8 and 9, it it goes further than that. No other subject is given more focus or more detail. Yeah, you're right. So really, it's both incorrect and inconsistent to relegate them to the dusty past, when we know the entire book was written for those of us upon whom the ends of the world are come. And another point to remember, Revelation uh, 11, verse 3. That's the, that's the vision of the two witnesses that prophesy for a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth, right? Absolutely, yes. And this whole action... <laughs> Sorry for the, the interruption. Sorry. No, you, you're right. And this whole action of the two witnesses that prophesy before the God of the whole earth that's given as an interlude between the sixth and seventh trumpets, this interlude covers all of chapter 10 and reaches to verse 14 of chapter 11. In here, Yahushua explains details of major events that will take place during the period of the trumpets. This interlude is unique. It provides prophetic details not recorded anywhere else in Scripture. And it's here we learn much about the hardships Yah's people will face as they prophesy for the last time during this time period. This is why we cannot accept that the trumpets of Revelation have already been fulfilled. Too much within the prophecy has not yet been fulfilled, even partially, let alone completely. 
All right. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> uh, that's all we've got time for today with that and uh, the questions. So thank you so much indeed for those. If you've got any questions or comments, we want to hear from you too. Go to our website at worldslastchance.com and click on Contact Us. If we can't cover your question on air, look out for it in our Q&As on our website. Hello, this is Elise O'Brien with today's Daily Promise from Yaw's Word. In high school, my brother got a summer job working construction. Now, this wasn't one of the higher paid jobs held by union workers. This was grunt work for minimum wage. The first thing the construction boss had him do was to dig footings for the foundation of a small building on a small lot in a poor part of town. The footings had to be about 30 centimeters deep and 45 centimeters wide, with straight, even sides and a level bottom. It was hot, back-breaking work, but he learned a lot. For a foundation to be stable, it needs to rest on firm, undisturbed soil, or better yet, bedrock. The type of foundation depends, of course, on the size and weight of the building, as well as the kind of soil it is being built on. Foundations for homes are typically no more than 30 to 60 centimeters deep. Skyscrapers, however, are another matter entirely. When the Petronas Towers were planned for Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, it was discovered that the soil at the site could not support the weight of the proposed structure. The towers soar 457 meters above the city. That's 1,500 feet in the air. So the builders had to dig down to bedrock. The foundation of steel and concrete went 120 meters into the ground. That's deep. To date, the Petronas Towers have the deepest foundation of any modern building on Earth. Now, by comparison, consider the world's tallest building, the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. It rises a mind-boggling 2,722 feet above the desert. That is over 829 meters tall. Its foundation has nearly a half a million tons of concrete and steel, and yet its foundation reaches only 50 meters into the ground. That is less than half the 120 meters of the Petronas Towers in Kuala Lumpur. Whether you're constructing a building, a business, or a life, The foundation you lay is always of the utmost importance. Isaiah 28 says, Therefore thus saith the Adonai Yahweh, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Yahweh's own son, Yahushua, is the believer's foundation, There is nothing you have ever done, nothing you have ever said, that can destroy that sure, solid foundation, because it's not based on who you are, but who and what He is, the sinless one, the Savior of the world, your older brother and best friend. We've been given great and precious promises. Go and start claiming. Scripture contains lots of warnings designed to keep us safe. There's one in 1 Thessalonians, which I think is especially applicable in these last days. So would you read it for us, Miles? It's 1 Thessalonians 5, and it's verses Mm -hmm. 21 to 22. Okay. Test all things, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. 
Yahweh doesn't want any of us to be deceived. He's calling Christians today to return to true biblical spirituality. A true connection with the Almighty doesn't come in a noisy group with big showy displays to prove to an audience of thousands how holy you are. Yeah, I like that phrase. It's so easy to get swept up in these showy displays and the beautiful music, of course, and the polished production of the show. But as an authentic spiritual experience comes individually, individually you have to pray and individually you have to listen for the still small voice speaking to your own heart. Listening for the still small voice is a lesson we need to learn today. Elijah on Mount Horeb was taught that Yahweh was not in the mighty wind that tore at the mountain. He wasn't in the earthquake that caused the ground to shake. He wasn't in the raging chaos of a firestorm. Instead, the creator of all chose to speak one-on-one with his servant in a still, small voice. And he'll do the same for us. He will. You don't need the professional productions, the showy displays. You can go to him for yourself. And that's a lesson we all need to take to heart. Now listen, friends, the Father knows the longing of your heart for a close, intimate connection with him. He's not going to leave it unsatisfied. That Mm. desire was planted in your heart by him. Yeah, that's true. And, And if we, being evil, know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will our Heavenly Father give his spirit to those who ask? I'm reminded of what Scripture says about how Yahushua was able to maintain a close, intimate connection with his father. The Gospel of Mark tells us, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. You may live in a crowded apartment building. You might be surrounded by non-believing family members, but you too can withdraw to your own solitary place. Maybe your solitary place is your bedroom. Maybe it's maybe it's your closet. Maybe it's a bench in a quiet corner of the park. Yeah, I knew a woman going through a difficult period in her life where her quiet place was her car parked oh. at the far end of a parking lot. Yeah, well, it's whatever works, to be honest, Dave. Maybe the, the only quiet you can get is locking yourself in the bathroom. Wherever you can carve out a quiet space to focus on and listen to the still, small voice, the father will draw near to you and speak to you personally. And that's a promise. And it's one we need to claim the closer we get to the end. A true personal experience in the deep things of Yah is very different from the artificiality and the melodrama of so much of what passes for spirituality today. The practice of slaying in the spirit relies heavily upon emotional excitement. Yahweh doesn't do that. He appeals to the logic, to reason. In Isaiah, he invites, Come now, let us reason together. Truth is logical. It is always consistent and it appeals to the intellect. It's error that relies on the false force of emotion. It reminds me of a statement actually by Letters Reason Ministries in talking about the slain in the spirit heresy, they say, quote, By pursuing a blessing, they have abandoned truth in place of a supernatural experience. This is not a biblical experience, but can be a supernatural one. In so doing, they have inadvertently become open to deception by accepting this without any testing. People have succumbed to the oldest charade. In their pursuit of a blessing, they have abandoned truth in place of a supernatural experience without ever testing the source for biblical proof. That is very true, yes. Again, divine truth does not rely on emotion. It appeals to the mind. Each one of us needs to rationally compare our beliefs, our theology, with Scripture. Don't compare theology with emotion because the emotional high experienced by spectators at a rock concert, it's the same sense of oneness and euphoria you can get singing hymns with 2,000 other believers at camp meeting. Yeah, and it's a lesson we all need to take to heart. Emotion should never be accepted as proof of anything, let alone something as important as salvation. You see, salvation requires uh, repentance and faith in Yahweh, not some ecstatic trance or emotional flight of fancy. Because, let me tell you, the devil is an expert 
at manipulating your emotions. Well, look what he did to Yahushua on the cross. The emotional yeah. feeling of being rejected by the Father was so great that Yahushua cried out, My Eloah, my Eloah, why hast thou forsaken me? He was feeling forsaken of Yah, and before the end, we will too. That's why we have to fill our minds with the promises of Yah's word now. There's no time in an emergency to prepare. When the law says, comply or die, what are you going to do? Will you cling to the word of Yah alone, even when every emotion is screaming at you to submit? In closing, I want to share just one final thought. When you've held certain beliefs for years, when you've been raised to believe that a certain body of doctrines is ultimate truth, it can feel very scary studying to see if they're true or not. A lot of religious organisations will instil fear in their followers. They'll imply that if you study other ideas, you'll be stepping on enchanted ground and Satan will deceive you. And that's just not true. Satan can never force your will, and Yah wants you to be grounded in your beliefs. But you can't be grounded just listening to someone else. People get favourite preachers they like to listen to because the preachers repeat what they already believe. That's not going to ground you in the truth. The only mm. way to be firmly established is to study Yah's word for yourself, and then his spirit will settle you into the truth and seal you for eternity. Thanks, Dave. In closing, I just want to share one final promise. It's Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. It says, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. If you will lay aside all your preconceived ideas and commit the keeping of your soul to Yah, he will make sure that you are never led astray. He will teach you and he will make sure that you are safe to save. Join us again tomorrow and until then, remember, Yahweh loves you and he is safe to trust. It's hard to raise godly youth in today's world. Negative influences come from so many different sources – movies, music, peers and social media. If you are looking for books or movies that can encourage and uplift the young people in your life, visit the youth section of our store at worldslastchance.com. The books and videos there have been carefully selected to provide the most inspiring example for youth and adults alike. Check it out at worldslastchance.com Not all items are available in all languages. Visit our website today to see what's available in your language. listening to WLC Radio. This programme, as well as past episodes of Radio WLC, are available for downloading on our website. These are great for sharing with friends and Bible studies. It's also a wonderful resource for those worshipping Yahweh, alone or at home. If you would like to listen to Radio WLC programmes, visit our website at worldslastchance.com. Click on the Radio WLC icon at the top right of the home page. This will allow you to download the episodes in your preferred language. There are also articles and videos available in a variety of languages.
have been listening to WLC Radio. Join us again tomorrow for another truth-filled message on WBCQ at 93.30 kHz on the 31 meter band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. Mm-hmm.